Yeah, here it is, John 5. I'm just going to read just the specific parts of John 5, just specific, and then you guys can engage me, whatever you want to do, you're free. Uh, John 5, 19, then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but let's finish it then. But what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, likewise, the son does. The son does whatever the father does and only what the father does. Let me skip to 21 because of time. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he will. The father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. So you honor me the same way you honor the father. Not less, not like a prophet, but the way you honor him. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And then 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming. That's the key phrase. The hour is coming. And is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. They're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. So the hour is coming. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. And then 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus says he's not the Father. He can do whatever the Father does. In the way the Father does it, give life, raise the dead. And then he says, he, the Son, at the hour, will raise them out of their grace by his voice. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Truth and life. Now, why is that interesting? Because Old Testament and the Quran, and I'm just speaking the Quran because you guys believe in it, affirm that at the hour, it is God who gives life to the dead and will raise them from their graves. That's in Surat Al-Hajj. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran, it says, Allah, he gives life, and the hour is coming, have no doubt, where <clears throat> he will give life to those in the graves. And even says he's the truth. Allah is the truth, al-Haq. So here in the Quran, Allah is called the truth. He gives life to the dead. And at the hour, Allah will raise them from the graves. All of which Jesus says, he's the one who will raise them from their graves by his voice at the hour. He's the one who gives life to the dead, and he is the truth. Even the Quran acknowledges that the son is not claiming to be a creature, even though he's not the father, but one with the father in essence, even though he's not the same person. So that's just to begin with. So if you guys want to engage, ask, go ahead. So Sam, thank you for that exposition. However, I think you will agree with me that we see the New Testament as a source for the life and teachings of Jesus Christ differently, very differently. So it is my position that the New Testament does not in any shape or no form convey to us true and authentic teachings about Jesus the Christ. I put forward that there are two things that we must hold in mind. I agree with Dan Wallace that we don't have the very words, ipsissima verba of Jesus Christ. We have ipsissima vox. We don't have any first-hand information, nor do we have any first-party witnesses, which demonstrates that Jesus Christ is God. I, I listened to your exposition and it's wonderful, but something that I, I think you missed perhaps, or maybe you didn't think about it was, well, wait a second, who is the source of this information and why should you and I take this to be authoritative? I want to point out if Jesus Christ is meant to be God, I think that the, the chapter is Romans chapter 6 verse 9, if I'm not mistaken, Sam can correct me there, where it says that Christ has overcome or defeated death, death no longer has mastery or dominion over him. Now the question therefore becomes, wait a second, if Sam follows the philosophy of religion, he knows the term maximum uh, greatest being, uh, or the maximum being of all. In this case, uh, for Muslims, and Muslims would be aware of this, we believe that God has the attribute of taking life and giving life. He is the source of life and the source of death. There is no disputation about that. Now, it comes into question, for the Muslims, can Allah lose one of his attributes? And can one of those attributes have mastery over him? This is the case for the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And so as a monotheist that believes that God's usia cannot be divided, that there is no economic uh, Godhead, I disagree with these principles. Uh, what I would like Sam to do is, does Christ at any one point identify that one, he is a different person from the Father, and two, that he shares the very same essence as God himself? I know he's going to go to John chapter 10. I don't discount that. But the question I put forward is, does Christ understand or does he ever give an exposition where he understands the categories of being and he argues for himself Sam's understanding of the nature of God? Now, I have about a minute, two minutes left. 
I understand Sam's position. If he assumes that the New Testament is historical, if he assumes that this is from a real and actual Christ, then I understand his point. But evidently, that's just an assumption, and it has not been qualified. So I would actually ask Sam to qualify that point before relying upon the text in the first place. So, so I, yeah. I'm going to cut short by two minutes. Uh, either Sam or William can engage. Okay, let me begin. Uh, number one, whether the New Testament is authentic or not, even though that is an important topic and I want to discuss it with you, it is irrelevant, irrelevant to the question, does the New Testament teach the deity of Christ? Uh, we were told, um, Sam was told that it was, um, that nobody agreed to sticking to the New Testament when talking about the deity of Christ. I know you want to talk about who wrote John and even Daniel Wallace that you cited. The same Daniel Wallace argues quite strongly, John wrote John and he wrote it pre-70 AD because he argues on John chapter five, verse two. But that's not the, neither here nor there, because to fairly engage this argument, not only do we appeal to historical evidence, but you as a Muslim, you have to then explain to me what the Quran is referring to when it's talking about the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. But if we open up that can of worms, we're not going to focus on the topic. So I'm going to ignore that for now to focus on the topic. Does the New Testament teach the deity of Christ? And are words ascribed to Jesus where Jesus claims to be God? We can come back, and I want to come back and talk about historical evidence and the Quranic position about the New Testament, as well as whether the manuscript evidence supports that the Quran you have can be a reliable facsimile of what was originally revealed through Muhammad, because you believe he's a prophet, it was revealed to him. But let's focus on this issue. You mentioned Paul, and you talked about that Jesus overcame death, and somehow God is the greatest conceivable being, and he can't lose any of his attributes. And I'm assuming by your statement there that you assume that if Jesus died, he lost one of the attributes that he's ever living, and somehow that means he's not the greatest conceivable being. Neither Paul nor John agree with your definition, nor does the Quran, because in John 10, 17, 18, John 10, 17, 18 says, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may pick it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power laid down and I have the power to take it up again. I received this command from my father, John 2, 19 and 22. There Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. I will raise it up in three days. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, yet you will raise it up in three days? And John says he was talking about the temple of his body. The only way Jesus could raise himself back to life, take back his life, if he was still ever living, he was still conscious, he didn't cease to exist. So implicit in your objection is the assumption that that means secession of life. That's not a biblical definition, nor is it a Quranic one, because you know your Quran better than I do. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 154. And Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 169 and 170, it says, those who were killed in the way of Allah, the martyrs, the Sharid, do not say they're dead. Nay, they're living, receiving provision from the Lord, even though you don't perceive how. So even the Quran agrees, that doesn't mean secession of life. And that shows how majestic Jesus is. He is the greatest conceivable being. Because as the greatest conceivable being, he can take on human nature, experience human death, and still be God, still be ever living, and still raise himself back to life. But I'm going to come back to the original point. The things that Jesus said or attributed to him in John, that he is the one who gives life. He's the one who will raise the dead from their graves at that hour by the sound of his voice. Or in John 14, 6, he's the truth. All of that is ascribed to Allah alone. So that means, as far as the New Testament is concerned, even the Quran would agree that the things that Jesus is said to have said can only be said by someone who's God in the flesh, even though he's not the Father. So there you go. Okay, so what stands out to me, Sam, is that, uh, so I'll stop at 1228, just to be clear. So what stands out to me, Sam, you assumed that the topic is, is Jesus God according to the New Testament? Now you, and as well as I will understand, I am not used as a Muslim, the Bible is not an authority for me. So to quote the Bible to demonstrate that Jesus is God does not qualify the claim in the first place. So for me, my opposition is simple and it's straightforward. You assume that the New Testament is an authority on the historical reality of Jesus' very existence. My contention here is that's a false assumption. Therefore, it does not follow, or it is non sequitur, that Christ is demonstrated to be God merely because the New Testament may frame him in that context. So you say here, um, uh, what is the Quranic view of the book of the Christians and Jews? That's another topic. You also say, you assume that I say that Paul says, since Jesus died, he lost an attribute. To be clear, I'm taking Paul on his face value. Paul, on a, uh, in very clear words, says, 
for death no longer has mastery over him. Now you have to understand, God cannot have an attribute overpower him because that, that becomes a rival to God. Uh, you mentioned the Quran, Surah 42 verse 11, lies a commit he shy, there is nothing like God. So he can't gain and lose attributes. You use a very good term, the uh, greatest conceivable being, again from William Lane Craig. I accept that point of view, that the greatest conceivable being is God, but implicit in that view is that you can compartmentalize the nature and attributes of God. So for me, it does not suffice that you merely quote the Bible and therefore it qualifies that Jesus is God. Rather, my contention is it's not an authoritative source. Therefore, you cannot assume that it gives you this information accurately. Therefore, it does not qualify that Christ himself is God. I still have two more minutes. I also want to point out here, when you said to me that I have to first accept Paul's view in order to engage with it that Christ is God, I disagree. My perspective is, Paul has an understanding and he describes God in such a way that he cannot be God. He is no longer the greatest conceivable being. My problem is not that Christ died. That is a straw man. My point is the text literally says that death no longer has dominion over him. If he is God, nothing can have dominion over him because like you said, the term you used, greatest conceivable being. So you actually need to look at the very nature of God, speak from an ontotheological perspective, because quite simply the Bible does not qualify your claim and it's not an authoritative uh, source of information. Uh, actually, even to the title, the deed of Christ does presuppose the New Testament and you guys know it presupposes the New Testament because the only documents you have about Jesus that come from the first century are the New Testament documents. But because you keep wanting to change the topic from the New Testament, I'm really trying to fight the urge to show that you Muslims cannot adopt a method of questioning the scriptures. If you're an atheist or agnostic, I could then engage you on that level and I can engage, let's say, Bart Ehrman on just the textual evidence and even the assertions, the assumptions he brings. But you're forcing me to show you that, yes, I can use the New Testament against you Muslims because your Quran forces you to then have me consult my scriptures to then judge according to my scriptures, and we can engage that. So do you want to change the topic, what the Quran says about the Bible, and that even the earliest sources of Islam confirm John as historically reliable, written by John? In Ibn Ishaq, Sirat Rasulullah, read the English translation. Ibn Ishaq, Sirat Rasulullah, <clears throat> the life of Muhammad, and I'll give you even the pages, page numbers, pages 103 and 104. Ibn Ishaq cites, and Ibn Ashan does not edit this, remove this from his edit, editing job of Ibn Ishaq, where he says that the gospel that God gave Jesus for the followers of the gospel, which John wrote down as a prophecy of the messenger. And there he quotes John 15 verses 23 to 16 verse 1 and says, John wrote it. And it's a genuine seeing of Jesus because it's the gospel given to Jesus that John wrote about your prophet. So no, you Muslims, you can't play that. If you're going to now want to argue the New Testament, then now I'm going to have to open the Quran and the Sunnah because you believe Muhammad and your opinion of the Bible can't be different from Muhammad. So now let's debate. Did Muhammad affirm my scriptures or do you thought they were corrupt? And I don't think you want to engage that because the evidence is on my side, not on your side. So yes, when you talk about the deed of Christ, I can shackle you to the New Testament because your prophet shackled you to the New Testament. So you're wrong. So if you want to engage that, we can. If you want to stick with the text, we can. Because I didn't even get to addressing Romans 6 in context, what Paul meant and didn't mean. But it's your, 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 your call, fellas. This is your house. We're your guests. Uh, we'll have a few other time about the Quran and the Hadith, about the Bible and the Gospel of John. So if you want to go there, we can do that. Just quote for me, when you can, and it's your turn, where Jesus, the term latreo, which is specific to the Father, is ever used for Jesus within the New Testament. I'm sure you can find that reference. So, Sam, I like your response. You say, well, you know, the topic presupposes that we have to read the New Testament. And if you have to question the New Testament as an authoritative source, therefore you have to question the Quran and Islamic sources. I am plainly stating, and I'm applying a principle that uh, Michael Lacona uses in his book on the resurrection of Jesus, where he says that there are three forms of uh, methodology. One is methodical credulity, which is what you applied. You take the Bible as the word of God, truthfully in the first place, and then you argue against the case made against it. So you assume that it's true, and you assume that it's historical, and you assume that it is preserved, and you assume that it is accurate. All of these are false assumptions. On the other hand, I am applying methodical uh, neutrality. 
I'm simply pointing out, I'm not appealing to the Quran. Sam, you can tell me if I ever quoted one verse in the Quran regarding Jesus the Christ. I have no intention of going to the Quran because I understand the topic is on the historical Christ and whether or not he claimed it to be God. So the point I put forward to you is quite simple. If you accept the New Testament as an authoritative source, and every word in it is instructional, I think as 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16 says, then you carry the burden of proof with you. Merely quoting someone and saying they believe Jesus was God is not evidence. It's merely a claim. And each claim must be qualified on its own merits. So I reject your assertion that if we mention the New Testament, then we have to mention the Quran. But me as the Muslim, I'm not appealing to the Quran. I'm appealing to the Greco-Roman context of the New Testament, its sources and its ability to be a truthful and accurate witness for the life of Christ Jesus. So now coming back to what Ibn, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Hijaz said, Mike Lacona is referring to criteria that can be used to people who are either Christian background or secular agnostic atheist, how to use criteria to determine whether something technically goes back to someone. Now, if I was dealing with an atheist agnostic, if I was dealing with a skeptic, I wouldn't appeal to the Quran because the Quran doesn't matter to them. I'm dealing with Muslims, so whether you don't want to bring the Quran up or not, I am going to bring up the Quran because you are a Muslim and you can't use standards against the Bible that goes against the testimony of Muhammad and the Quran and can be used more forcefully against you. So you are shackled. You have to accept the New Testament because your prophet accepted the New Testament. And I'm just going to be, I'm going to give you two verses. If I cannot know what Jesus said historically, or only know parts of what Jesus said, because the New Testament documents are unreliable, then I want you now to say in front of everyone, I'm no longer a Muslim. I reject Muhammad. So then I can treat you accordingly as if you're Bart Ehrman, so I don't have to appeal to the Quran. But as long as you're a Muslim, you're stuck with the Quran, because in chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and chapter 61, verse 14, your Quran says that God said to Jesus, he will make his followers uppermost dominant till the day of resurrection, and they'd be victorious, and he gave them the victory. So if the Quran is right, Jesus' true followers triumphed, they were not vanquished, they were not defeated, they were uppermost, they were victorious, and their victory would remain till the day of resurrection. But if I agree with you, the New Testament documents, no one knows who really wrote them, meaning the Gospels, and they embellished and they added. That means a group of people came in, destroyed the message of Jesus and his followers, were able to hijack their message because their message got lost, and it disappeared. So we cannot know for certain Jesus said this, but the Quran says that can't be the case. That's why even Al-Qurtubi, Al-Qurtubi cites chapter 61 verse 14 and then cites the tradition of Ibn Ishaq where Ibn Ishaq cites a tradition, a tribute to your prophet that when Jesus sent out his followers, he mentions them. And two of the followers, Peter and Paul, who went to Rome and he mentions Matthew. So if you're a Muslim, you're stuck yeah. with it. You're shackled. If you're a Muslim, you yeah. have to then accept the Bible. But go ahead. My time is up, yeah. I guess. You yeah, my time's right. up? Yep. Four minutes, okay, six good. seconds. Sorry, I'll get to that on the next rebuttal. Sorry about that, William. What is peculiar is you say to me, um, how do I use Lacuna's methodology when it's for Christians and skeptics? To be clear, he uses his own methodology, and this can be applied to anyone that studies historiography. You do not have to be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, or a secular individual to use the principles of historiography. Where does that rule come from? And can you cite it for me, please? Secondly, you said, well, wait a second. If we can't trust what is written about Jesus in the Bible, then you as a Muslim should give up the Quran. But the point is, I'm not appealing to the Quran for my case. Independent of the Quran, using Greco-Roman uh, literary standards, using sexual criticism, source criticism, I fully understand and agree that Christ Jesus is not God, and we have not a single statement of his which is reliable and can be attested to, which demonstrates that Christ is God. Now, I put the question to you, at what point does Christ receive Latreo? This is almost as James D.G. Dunn, he, who recently passed, when he mentioned the early worship of Christians, he specifies that Latreo is specific to the Father. Now, my further point is, if you say, well, you as a Muslim have to depend on the Quran for this case, not once have I referenced the Quran in this case. And there is no point at which you can show to me the Quran refers to the Kaina Diatheke. Now, one point is to do that. It never says uh, Kitab al-Muqaddas. It never says any of those terms. Therefore, or Majmu al-Qutub. 
never refers that in that sense. Now, Sam, you earlier argued, and you actually agree with me, even though you might shake your head, no, maybe, but you agreed with me that there is no one group of Christians. In the same way, there is no one group of Jews or Muslims. Now, when the Quran refers to the people of the book, you automatically assume it refers to people like you. But at no point did any companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the Prophet himself ever derive thick rulings from the writings of the Jews and the Christians in his day. Every point I've established. Uh, William, how much time do I have left, if you mind me asking? William. You have two minutes left. I'm sorry, I was muted. Two minutes. Uh, sorry. So I, I think I've made a case and I've made my point. One does not need to be a secular individual or an atheist to apply, to apply the principles of historiography. That is what we must do, and it's a standard uh, methodology within scholarship. Ijaz, to, to try to escape the burn of proof and appeal to modern criteria, when that's a criteria that was unknown to your prophet, unknown to his companions, unknown to the Christians in the first century and the second century and third century, again, I'm going to say, you're not really dealing with the impact of my argument. To mention 20th or 21st century criteria that was not used to determine truth. That's not what your prophet did. He didn't play, appeal to this criteria to determine what Jesus said centuries prior. So I'm going to ask you as a Muslim, I'm going to bind you as a Muslim to your sources, shackle to your sources, Use your prophet's method of determining historicity, not a method brought up by 20th or 21st century scholars, unknown to your prophet, unknown to his companions, unknown to the people before him, unknown to Jesus' followers. That's not what they did to determine truth. And then let me correct you. The Quran does speak of the kitab. When you said it doesn't say kitab al-muqaddis, nowhere does the Quran call any book muqaddis. So here's my challenge. Show me in the Quran where any book is called Muqaddis. It doesn't use that phraseology. So instead of insisting to have the Quran speak in a language other than it speaks, deal with the language of the Quran. In chapter 2, verse 113, it says, the Jews and the Christians read the Kitab. That would be the Arabic equivalent of the Bible. And I mentioned to you Ibn Ishaq confirming the Gospel of John as written by John, because Ibn Ishaq wasn't a 21st century quote-unquote historian. He took for granted that what the Christians told him was right because he worked under the assumption, which you should be working under, that the Quran is right. Jesus' followers triumph. That means their message triumph because you can't have a victory when the message is destroyed. That's not a victory. That's a defeat. And since the Gospels are the only Gospels that have been preserved, that means they have your God's blessing and we can use them to judge whether Jesus claimed to be God. And I think my time is up. Okay, so I have about a minute and 12 seconds. Thank you, Brother Ibn Anwar. So, uh, Sam, you said modern criteria method was unknown to the first Muslims. You refer to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions. I want to point out Quran 16, uh, chapter, uh, verse 125, tells us ability, uh, ability uh, here, Ahsan, to argue in the best way. Argue, not quarrel. So argue means using logic. How do we know this in Quran Surah 10? I think it's verse 100. It mentions that the best of people generally uh, are those who use reason and those are defiled who do not use reason. So this is in fact a method uh, entrenched within the Quran and I have to shackle you to the New Testament. So you cannot escape the problem of Jesus' lack of deity. So I'll point out some things that you mentioned. You said, well, wait a second, Jesus' message is Jesus' message one, therefore, you know, the Christians are right. Small problem there. Jesus' message, according to the understanding of Muslims, it's the edge it's the consensus, that the Muslims are the ones referred to in that verse. You know and I know that Muslims believe the followers of Jesus were Muslim, and we believe that we are the spiritual inheritors of the message which Christ Jesus conveyed. So we as Muslims have no problem with that. You, the Christian, find yourself in a difficult position because I've noticed you've moved the discussion to the Quran and you are unable to establish Christ's deity from the New Testament. So again, Sam, if you have any shred of credibility, and you do have some, you need to establish the reliability of the New Testament text and its ability to convey the message. And I will hold you to what the early church father says. So here is what um, Dale C. Allison Jr. mentioned in his book, The Historical Christ and Theological Jesus. He says, even more clear-eyed was Origen, who in the third century anticipated modern criticism by candidly observing that at many points the four Gospels do not agree. He inferred that their truths cannot reside in the material 
Later, the evangelists sometimes altered things which from the eye of history occurred one or otherwise. They could speak of something that happened in one place as if it happened in another, of what happened at a certain time as if it happened at another time. And they were in uh, the spiritual I truth. Okay, let me just finish. Can I finish the sentence? One I sentence. Finish. The spiritual truth was often preserved, one might say, in the spiritual falsehood. And I will post a reference in the chat if that's okay. Coming back to the issue. Again, Ajaz didn't hear what I said. I said that Al Qurtubi quoted chapter 61, verse 14. Al Qurtubi, who said that this was fulfilled when Allah gave victory to the, to the followers of Jesus. Those who were victorious and sent out with the victorious message, Peter and Paul. And Al Qurtubi doesn't say Daif or, you know, this is fake. This is how God kept his promise. He empowered Peter, Paul, Matthew, and others, John, sent them out throughout the whole world to spread this message, a message that is dominated from the time of Jesus till the day of resurrection. And I know you Muslims want to say it's about Islam. That's not what the verses say. 355 and 6114, let me repeat. It says to Jesus, I'll make your followers victorious from when? When he was taken to Allah till the day of resurrection. It doesn't say they'll be victorious for a short while, the message will be destroyed, then the Muslims will come in and they'll repair the message, restore the message, and then it'll dominate their resurrection. I know you don't like the way the Quran is written, but I'm simply quoting the Quran as it is, and it confirms my point, not yours, and you are bound to the New Testament, and not an atheist, and you're not bound me. So I'm going to hold you accountable to your Quran. You have Time. to respect my New Testament. And follow anyway, go ahead. So thank you for your response, Sam. I noticed that in the four minutes you had, you repeated John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, and you also reference Al Qurtubi on Quran Surah 3, verse 35. However, I said to you, it's the Ijma, or it's the consensus of the Muslims, that this refers to the Muslims. Now, you will say to me, but you as a Muslim have to believe that. Well, you as a Christian equally must believe that the New Testament teaches that Jesus is God. I don't interpret your scripture for you. I actually let you explain it. So from our perspective, no, this does not refer to Jesus and the Christians who apply to them. I'll make a simple point by this. If I were to ask a Christian, are you a monolith? The answer will be no. So if your argument is that the most successful group would be among the Christians, then some, you should become a Catholic today. But you will not become a Catholic. I know some of your beliefs have changed. William should be the one saying, yes, this verse refers to me. But you as a Protestant or quasi-Orthodox believer cannot make that claim. You will notice, Sam, the question is, is Jesus God? I put the question to you to demonstrate that to me, but you focused only on the Quran because I personally believe that you do not have an answer to the question. You can uh, shift the goalposts, but unfortunately, it does not work for you. Now, John chapter uh, 5, verses 1 to 5, demonstrate for me that this work is not from God and that it actually has errors. So I want to point out in verse 1, after this, there was a festival of Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Problem, the definite article before the word festival is missing. I think it's just a letter, uh, eta, if I'm not mistaken. And so did he go to the festival, which would be Passover, or any random festival? Already the question of the historicity of this passage comes into question. You know as well, when it mentions in verses 3 and 5, the angels move in the water, a later addition. So the question then becomes, if this work is authentic, and we have all of these emendations which contradict history, for example, the pillars at the pool, I think the, 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 the white fathers in the French ex, uh, expedition to Jerusalem point out that the number of colonnades are actually wrong. I think it's off by one. So this chapter tells me that this book was not written by a person who knew Jesus can testify the truth about him, and therefore it is not an accurate source of information. The burden of the proof is upon you, Please give me that statement of Latreo. It's been four turns. You haven't given it. Thank you. Now, coming back to Ibn Anwar. Uh, Anwar. Ijaz, Ijaz, you again help make my case that you be a Muslim. So I want you to come and say I'm not a Muslim because your faith confirmed the scriptures in the possession of the Christians in the sixth century. Even Ibn Ishaq says that John wrote down the gospel that contained the prophecy of Muhammad. So now I'm going to return the favor to you. The copies that the Christians had at the time of Muhammad, did they have the, the Gospels of John? Did it have the definite article or not before the festival? That's number one. Number two, the copies that your prophet confirmed in the possession of the Christians, which would include the copies of John, because we even know Ibn Ishaq later knows they have John, and they believe John wrote, gave to Jesus. Does it have that very...
angels during the pool. The burden's on you to answer because if you say yes, your prophet confirmed the story of the angels during the pool. Your prophet confirmed whether the article should be before the fess or not. See, you're not Bart Ehrman. You can't use these arguments. You're a Muslim. You're stuck with your prophet confirming my scriptures and what those scriptures looked like at the time of the Christians. He didn't say, oh, because there's no definite article, it's corrupt. No, what you have, the uncorrupt words of God, judge by them. We can debate that. It's not I'm changing the goalpost. I'm holding you honest and responsible to what you're supposed to believe as a Muslim. So please, I want to answer for everyone. Name the copies of John in the 6th century, 7th century, 7th century. And tell us which of those copies had the article, didn't have the article, and how many of them didn't have the story of the angels stirring the pool, and whether those copies were in the possession of the Christians in Arabia, because whatever they had, Muhammad said, true, uncorrupt, judged by them, and we can talk about that. So again, don't argue like an agnostic or an atheist, you're not. And to correct you, Qurtubi did say the followers of Jesus that Allah gave the victory to, and it's not about ijma and consensus. Peter and Paul, because he knew historically the only followers of Jesus that were sent out that dominated were folks like Peter and Paul. But then Peter and Paul were uppermost. Where does it say then their message would be destroyed, lost, only parts of it would remain until Muhammad revived it? It's not there. I'm just going by the Quran and the Hadith. If you don't want me to go by the Quran because you reject the Quran, say it. I don't believe Quran, it's a fraud. I won't use these arguments. Then we'll be consistent. But no, the evidence is against you. You're stuck with my New Testament and Jesus claims to be God. And I'll go to Latro and other passages, not just John 5, but John 5 has been too hot to handle. None of you have been able to refute it. Glory to Jesus Christ. Right. So Sam, it's been about six turns. And the one question I asked you've been unable to address. Is the term Latreu ever used for Jesus? The answer is no. James D.G. Dunn, who recently died, confirmed that on his work on the early Christian worship. Now, it's interesting that you appeal to Bilal Phillips and say, well, you've got to accept whatever he says. Well, just to remind you, it's Quran, Sunnah, Ijman, Qiyas. One man does not make Ijma, just to be clear. So your, your understanding of Islam is deficient in that respect. Secondly, you said to me, and it's a very strange argument, my prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, confirmed your Bible. Here's the question I put to you, because I know you have the answer. Do you have a single manuscript of the New Testament circulating in Arabia extant to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the uh, terminus uh, post crime of 610 to the terminus anti crime of 632? You do not have that. So you're appealing to the Christians at that time and say, well, whatever they had, we also had. I want to point out in Dr. Brent Nungby's book, uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, uh, what's his book's name? God's Library. He points out that from the 2nd to the 9th century CE in Oxyrhynchus and villages along the Nile, that they actually copied more non-canonical and deuterocanonical works more than the New Testament writings. So it stands to reason, therefore, it's a false assumption to believe or assert that the Christians in Arabia had the same data that you appeal to. It's quite clear from the manuscript testimony from uh, God's Library, the book by Dr. Brent Nungbury, the deuterocanonical deutero and... Uh, uh, just the general books outside of the canon were copied and used more by Christians in that area. Lastly, it's very strange that you say Kultubi says Peter and Paul. Here's the question I put to you. Does Kultubi say the Christians of his day, the Roman Catholics, which were the major religion at his point, does he say they are upon the right path? That is the religion we should follow. No. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, recites from the Quran, uh, this refers to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 where God is referred to as a son who is delivered, who is born unto us the Quran uses the Hebrew equivalents in Arabic to refute that point of view so if your argument is that the Quran affirms the Bible, debunked if your argument is that Jesus is worshipped and you can demonstrate it from the Bible you have failed to do so summarily lastly I put the question to you I read the quote from, uh, from uh, Origen, who directly says the truth is contained within the material falsehood. And I pointed out to you that John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, including the healing of the blind man, are later additions, which James White also agrees with. So you stand against the majority of Christian scholarship because you do not want to concede the point that you have zero evidence that Christ was worshipped as the one true God from uh, the scripture itself. Coming back to Ijaz, again Ijaz, 
when you tell me that Kurtubi think the Christians at that time were true believers, that's irrelevant to his exegesis of 6114. When he interprets 6114, and he knows this is supposedly addressed to Jesus in the first century and promising Jesus, his followers will be victorious, Al Qurtubi has no choice but to look at the history to see who are those followers that were made victorious. And he has no choice because there were no other followers. Because all the documents that prevailed and disseminated throughout the world say it's Paul and Peter and John and Matthew. But he didn't reason out the implication and he's avoiding the implication like you are. If they were the true followers and they were victorious, that means their message was true. And if their message is true, then God preserved it. Well, the message he preserved is the writings of the New Testament. And that's why it's still spreading like wildfire all over the world, which is why you're arguing tooth and nail against its veracity and against its statements, because you know this message exposes Islam and proves Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, let me correct again your challenge to me. I don't know if you're referring to the Arabic versions of the Gospels not being extant in the 7th century. Even if you believe that, then that means you're not a Sunni, because according to Sal Bukhari, volume 1, number 3, we know there was a Gospel in Arabic written by Waraka bin Nofil. So do you reject that? Well, I, I wouldn't blame you to reject it, because it comes over 100 years after the death of your, your prophet. Since you're a Sunni, you are going to have to agree with your tradition, there were Gospels in Arabic. Because Waraka bin Nofil wrote the gospel in Arabic and he would write it in Hebrew, which some say it meant Syriac. So why are you going against your sources? Just because we don't have any extant manuscript evidence doesn't mean none existed. But more than that, you don't need it to be in Arabic for the gospels and the New Testament writings to be in circulation because they could be in all the different languages. Even at the time of Muhammad, the Christians would have been reading Syriac. Syriac would have been the language they read. So I'm going to issue my challenge to you again. The copies of John in all the languages in the 7th century, especially to the Arabs, it doesn't have to be Arabic, in Syriac, in Coptic, you name it, did it contain the definite article before the festival and didn't have the angel stirring the waters? In other words, the 7th century copies of John, did it have it? If it did, you're stuck with it. You have to amend it. You have to accept it because your prophet said, those are the uncorrupt words of God. Let me give you the verses real quickly to show you he was confirming those scriptures that existed at that time, not some scriptures that didn't exist, that we're just going to make up out of our imagination. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 40 to 44. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 89 to 91. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 97. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 101. Chapter 2, verse 113. Chapter 2, verse 121. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verses 113 and 114. Chapter 4, verse 47. Chapter 5, verses 43 and 48. Chapter 10, verse 37, verse 94. Chapter 12, verse 111. Chapter 46, right, verse 12, fine. verse 30. Game over. My Bible is uncorrupt and you're bound to it. Yeah, very strange that the Christian is arguing what our sources of our deen are. Very strange. Uh, only Muslims can do that. So, Sam, I put that challenge to you. Now, it's interesting that you say, well, wait a second, there was a gospel by Waraka, and therefore we must accept that one. Uh, that, that hadith that you quoted, did the Prophet say that we have to accept it? No. Uh, hold on. Your argument is that whatever existed in the 7th century, wherever it is in the world, and it was the New Testament, therefore the Quran affirms it. At no point does the Quran affirm the New Testament or the Old Testament. In fact, it does the direct opposite in Quran, Surah 2, verses 1, uh, uh, verse 75 to 79, Surah 6, verse 91. These point to the corruption of the previous scriptures, which we reject in total. Uh, to follow up on the point that you made as well, well, wait a second, if it exists at this time, therefore it must mean we must affirm it. Here is the challenge. Quote for me one manuscript that is extant that qualifies your claim because already pointed out in Oxyrhynchus and along the Nile, the Christians there were not limited to the New Testament. So you may, you are forcing a boundary, a delimitation, which does not actually exist. And we know as a matter of fact, that the Northern tribes in Arabia, in the Northeast and the Northwest, the border in between the Roman Empire and the Mesopotamians, so, sorry, Sasanians, they actually had beliefs which contradict yours. They actually affirmed dynamic monarchianism, some were Nestorians. So are you affirming their writings as well? The answer is simply no. All of this, and an A try some, not once have you shown me in the New Testament where Latreo is done towards Jesus. That was the one challenge. The problem is, do you know the works that were circulated in Anoxyrhynchus and in the villages around it that were published by the Christian scribes at that point in time? 
just give me a book that is deuterocanonical that was popularly uh, recorded in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth century, which uh, provides your point of view. So the, the point stands that, guess what? There are works which they rejected, you as a Christian will reject. All I need you to do is give me a list of three of the works that were specifically uncovered. I'm going to give you a reference. It's in Dr. Brent Nungby's book. He actually has a chart on page 248, and he actually quite clearly states non-New Testament manuscripts, they always always outnumbered the Christian manuscripts. That includes the New Testament. So the point stands... I, I, thank, you. I thank you, Ibn Anwar. So the point stands thereby that you've made an error in reasoning. If it is that you can identify the works which were due to canonical, that they were copying in those cities, you may have a point. So just give me a few and let's see and provide a quote and citation for it. Now, what is peculiar is that none of you seem to give evidence that Christ was God. Your evidence seems to be, well, Christians thought he was God, therefore he was God. How is that not circular reasoning? I want to point out as well, a Hindu tells me that Krishna is God. Well, I guess that's it then. I got to be like you and Sam and become a Hindu. No. The point is, we do not take that statement as a testament to belief. All Sam has to do, and you too as well, uh, William, you have to provide the earliest writings that testify that Christ is God, which is extant to us today, and then we can work backwards. Scholars always use as a foundational principle, they identify their sources, try to reconstruct them, give us a terminus postquem and a terminus antiquem. Simple terms, simple ideas. None of you have seemed to be able to give us evidence that Christ was God. Your, your only argument is either Christians say he's God, therefore he's God, or the Bible, as I interpret it, says he's God, therefore he's God. None of those are good enough. Sam is pretty strange because he says, well, wait a second, uh, you have all these verses in the Quran which affirm his scripture. Just do me one favor, Sam, one favor. If the Quran affirms the New Testament, just show me one place at which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or his companions used as a form of delil or evidence the New Testament. Nowhere. And if it was extant to his time, then you would be able to demonstrate this for me. It seems to be the case that you are unable to do so. I'm very interested in what you come up with, Latroyo. It took you, what, 10 sessions? 40 minutes? Let's see what you have. I give up the rest of my time so Sam can uh, provide the evidence. My final point, and that's it, done, folks. We've got to respect the time. It's late for a lot of people. So anyway, by the grace of God here, Revelation 22. I'm going to start with Revelation 22. I know if I want to quote Revelation, you're going to say, well, we don't know who wrote it and the providence. Okay, fine. I'm just going to make my case from Revelation. Okay, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Then he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. <clears throat> God and the Lamb. Let me skip because of, because of time. I want to skip, man. I want to get to the salient points. We'll start at 3, and I'll go to 5. There shall be no more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The word is Latro. The question is, when it says his servants shall serve him, is it referring to God or the Lamb or both collectively? If I had more time, I can unpack this and show that singular pronouns are used both for God and Christ collectively. Just two examples off the top of my head. If you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 to 17, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. But now to prove that Jesus is definitely included in the Latruo here, because the word is Latruo. If you look at any lexical source, I'll tell you Latruo is often associated with priestly service. It's the sacred service rendered by priest in the temple. So here to prove that Jesus is one of those divine persons, not gods, that receives Latruo, Remember, don't take my word for it. Look at the lexical source. Latro is used in reference to the sacred service in the temple by the priest. Revelation 20, verses, verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. God and Christ together have priests serving him. What kind of service they give? Sacrificial, temple service, which is Latruo. So God and Christ have priests that give them service, and they shall reign with them a thousand years. Further proof that Jesus is included in the pronoun, that he is the object of Latruo. It says, his servants will serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. So notice, whoever this is who's being served has servants, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. So now we know the Father, his name will be on it. But also in Revelation 3, 12, 
it says they'll have the name of his God and the temple of his God and there'll be a pillar in his God and they'll have his new name on their forehead. So Jesus is included. And does Jesus have servants in Revelation 2? Yep, Revelation 2, verses 18 to 23. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like fine brass says these things. So the son of God is speaking, verse 20. But I have a few things against you. You permit that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants, his servants, his name on their forehead, serve him, he has priests. And finally, the icing on the cake to show that Jesus is worshiped and does receive literal and is worshiped to the extent, same extent that God the Father is worshiped, even though he's not God the Father. Revelation 5, verses 18 to 14. Revelation 5, verses 18 to 14. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. So spirit creatures are falling down before the Lamb in heaven, a vision that John sees by the Spirit. Fall down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. So you're worthy of this praise because of the redemption. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign on earth. Verses 11 and 12, quickly. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and living creatures and the elders, the voices of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and blessing. So now all the angels render to the Lamb this glory, this worship. Finally, Verse 13 and 14. This is the, the, the doozy. Verse 13 and 14. Then I heard every creature which is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that are in them. John exhausts the language. Every created thing in the entire creation saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the Lamb is distinguished from every creature and is receiving the same worship that God the Father receives from every creature, showing he's uncreated and equal in glory and dignity to the Father. Be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever and for the same extent. And finally, verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So Jesus with the Father is worshiped by every creature to the same degree, for the same extent. Jesus, like the Father, has his name on his servants. He has servants. Jesus, like the Father, has priests. And what do priests do? They offer latrul. So God and the Lamb have priests offering latrul. And that's Revelation. But again, who wrote Revelation? What's its provenance? We don't know. I know that will be the argument. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I'm done. Right. So I noticed that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, it actually says O2 at the end of the verse. And it seems to me that the commentators are confused whether it refers to the Lamb or it refers to God himself, the Father. And it seems to me that if it's always used exclusively by context in the New Testament, strictly for the Father, then the understanding here is that it can only refer to the Father and not the Lamb of God. What is interesting is that when you quoted Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 to 14, you actually said, worthy is the Lamb to receive. That stands out because if he's God, there is nothing he can receive, which he does not already possess. Further on, it goes on to say that, uh, saying to him who sits on the throne, you would agree that the Christ uh, does not sit on the throne, it's specifically the Father, so that's quite uh, a point against you. The God on the throne is the Father, not the person to his right hand. You know what my comment is there on that one. So it's quite peculiar that we took like 12 sessions for you to argue that the word here used in Revelation 22, 3 must apply to Jesus, but you have to acknowledge by the Greek and refers to him who is the Father, the pronoun at the end of the sentence. So the point stands thereby, you were unable to qualify that Christ is God. And you are correct. I would have asked you who wrote the uh, book of Revelation. Was it John of Patmos? What is his earliest witness? I believe it's uh, uh, UNCL0189. I could be wrong on that. And I think that comes from the late second, mid third century. So it's quite peculiar that it takes a book that was disputed in the canon to qualify your point for you. So if this is, uh, you know what, when I checked my NA28, I could not identify the uh, earliest source for it. I think it's uh, Codex uh, Sinaiticus, sorry. Yep, Codex Sinaiticus from the initial corrector. So it seems to be a fourth century verse that you're generally appealing to. If the church fathers quoted it, I would have liked to see that. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done.